Waking up to another light No more sorrow and no more night You're the light, let it shine now Let it shine now Burning bright cause we're not ashamed Got a world to illuminate You're the light, let it shine now Let it shine now
that's lost In a world that's broken I will be your voice Let your words be spoken Let the lame man walk Let the blind eyes see Let them see you When they look at me I want to tell the world about you I want to tell the world about you I want the world to know that there's a hand that's holding me I want the world to know I once was blind but now I see I'll tell the world about like thunder You made it all God of wonder You conquered death You rose in glory So that my life can tell your story want to tell the world where we are a Jesus-centered community creating gracious space through acts of generous love. Many of you know Gareth as well. You've seen him in videos or at church on Sundays. Uh, he's taking on a new title for me this week as my fiance. So we are super stoked and I just wanted to share that announcement with my church family who have meant so much to us this past year as we've journeyed with you for about a year and a half now, so thank you for all of your support. We're excited for this next year. Something that we would love to do as a community this morning is to read the Lord's Prayer together. And then Simon is gonna lead us in some live worship. He'll do the opening song as well as response song. So I love being led by worship, uh, in worship by Simon. So would you join me uh, from wherever you are, your living room, your kitchen, wherever you are, and read aloud the Lord's Prayer together. The words will be on the screen below. So let's pray. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Coast Hills, let us sing and praise our God together. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our sea.
Sunday. Good morning, Coast Hills. I'm reading from Matthew 28, 16 to 20, the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hello and welcome to Coast Hills Community Church online service yet again for September 6, 2020. My name is Kevin Snyder, and I'm the lead pastor here at Coast Hills Community Church, where we aspire to be a Jesus-centered community, creating gracious space 
through acts of generous love. Today is our first day in our series that we have entitled Renovation. Renovation means to change the exi existing structure, structure, materials, uh, or a look to accommodate a current need. Have you ever renovated your house in some way? Either by painting, putting up new fixtures or handles, or maybe taking down walls and restructuring the actual building. My wife Sharon and I were chatting about this and we thought that it might be pretty insightful and somewhat humorous if we could get many of you to send in your renovation stories, whether you write those down via email or maybe send some um, uh, video clips to us, you can send that to renovation at coasthillschurch.com, renovation at coasthillschurch.com. And we'd be great, it'd be great to see this over the next few months uh, and hear your personal stories of renovation and how, um, maybe how smoothly everything has gone, <laughs> or maybe not so smoothly. Just recently, we, we uh, painted our basement, repainted our basement. We did all the research, we looked at all the options, then we chose the color and paint uh, and then we did the first coat. Once the paint was on the walls and we actually looked at it with the lighting down there, we realized that it looked quite different than the swatch that we had upstairs. Then we took the swatch downstairs, we put it on the paint that we just had painted and it was identical. It just looked a lot different and um, we didn't really love it. So guess what we did? Ha. We took the remainder of the paint back to the paint store, asked what they thought, got their insight, and then they added a little bit of yellow, like barely any. And then we put this new color on, and it was way better. And I need to say that during the process, Sharon and I had what we would say negotiations. As we were debating if we should maybe should we bother to take it back? Do we just put it up and leave it like this? Uh, what do we do? In the end, after the negotiations, I had to admit that changing the color ever so slightly was the right thing to do. When we need to renovate, when we need to change things, or change the way we do things, especially in the context of a group or a community, it can be unsettling. And it takes trial and error and negotiations and a bunch of hard work. So for the next two months or so, our sermon series, we are going to be dealing with what kind of renovations we need to make as a church and as individuals to accommodate our current needs as Jesus followers, both corporately and individually. This pandemic has forced us to change all kinds of ways of how we live. This pandemic has also changed, as we've noticed, the way the church operates. And we need to step forward now in a way, in ways that make sense for our church. I was um, at a wedding this weekend and someone who I knew, who knew I was a pastor, asked me this question. What do you think the future of church is going to look like after this pandemic? And I said, uh, we're trying to figure what the present church looks like during the pandemic. <laughs> and we've been asking these questions for several months now. As a leadership team, we've been struggling and working through this as well. We believe that the way we do church has already changed and needs to change and shift and be renovated so that the purpose of the church will continue to thrive. So this sermon I've entitled Good Bones. Good Bones was a renovation show that maybe it's still on HG, HGTV, say that quickly 10 times, where a mom, and her, a mom and a daughter team would go around and find old houses that needed all kinds of renovations, but had good bones. Good bones meaning they wouldn't have to knock down the house but we keep the basic structure of the house, but they'd renovate everything else. What I'm going to look at today are the good bones that the church needs to work with 
and which cannot and should not be ever knocked down. Everything else might be up for grabs for renovation, but what we're going to look at today will be the good bones that the church needs to keep in place. So let's get at it. We're going to look at Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw them, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This passage is known as the Great Commission. Jesus gives this commission to his disciples to go and do. These are the last words of Jesus to his disciples that Matthew records. And these last words are to the ones who are to be com- commissioned to live out the kingdom of God here on earth. So verse 16 says, the disciples waited for Jesus. A few verses earlier in Matthew 28 verse 10, when the women saw the empty tomb and were encountered the risen Jesus, Jesus was telling them to go to Galilee because he was going to go there ahead of them, ahead of them. And he told the women to tell his brothers, the disciples, to go. So the women, in their joy, went and told the others. And that's what they did. And the others, who probably didn't believe what the women were saying, and some would have, they all went to Galilee. After the death of Jesus, they would have had all kinds of doubts and fears. So you have this group of friends that are gathering to meet Jesus and and, and meet together. Some are super excited and super stoked about the resurrection, and others actually don't believe it. They're doubting. They're wondering, what is happening? And then, what does Jesus do? In verse 17, Jesus sends them all, even those who doubt. Jesus then speaks. He says that all authority in heaven and earth was given to him. Jesus reminds the disciples that he is the Lord and Caesar is not. All authority was given to him. In heaven and on earth, he says, Jesus is Lord was a phrase that the church took from the Romans and used to have, have people understand who Jesus was. The Romans would have used this phrase, Caesar is Lord, to pronounce uh, the power of the Roman government, to reveal the military might, the domination, and the rule of Caesar, that he was Lord. That reflects Caesar is Lord, the one that rules over his people with power. Jesus is saying, I have all authority on heaven, in heaven, and on earth. What does this mean? Jesus was killed by the ruling leaders of his time, the religious, political leaders. His disciples were probably thinking that his rule and reign would not look like dying on a Roman cross. That is one thing for sure. But now, after the resurrection, Jesus says that all a power and authority has been given to him. To go and rule? And what does it look like? Do they organize themselves in military fashion? even though Jesus has all of power and authority? No, we'll see later on that he actually organizes them as a family to live out a different way of living. And Jesus sends out them all, even the ones that were doubting. Now, some of us, as we're looking forward to what the church needs to do and change, we might be doubting what's happening. But if we can be thinking about these good bones 
we can still accomplish what Jesus is calling us to do, even as we change in some ways. So Jesus says, therefore go. Go and live this kind of self-sacrificial, cruciform, enemy-loving life to reveal that I am Lord. And he gives them three things to do. These are the good bones. He says, make disciples, baptize people, and teach them everything I've commanded you. So let's look at those three things. First, make disciples. A disciple is a student, a pupil, willing to learn and willing to admit that they need to unlearn and relearn everything. It takes humility to be a pupil. It takes humility to be a disciple. It takes humility to be a learner. If you look at the lives of some of the disciples, you will see this kind of thing happening all the time. Peter, James, and John, for sure, were jockeying for position and power a lot of the time while they were with Jesus those three years. And Jesus had to set them straight as well, sometimes James and John's mother. If you want to be first in the kingdom, he says, you need to be last. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you need to be like this little child. If you think God wants to call down fire on a group of people, then think again, because Jesus doesn't do that sort of thing. And Jesus had to say to them numerous times, not so with you. We're not gonna wield power like this. We're going to love people into the kingdom and reveal to them there's a different way to live. And it doesn't look like Caesar. It looks like Jesus. It was in the daily following of Jesus in the context of, of community that the disciples became disciples, unlearning, learning, and relearning what it looks like to follow Jesus. So to make disciples, we keep pointing others to Jesus. Look at Jesus. Watch the way he lives, and let's live like that. Second thing, baptize people. This is interesting. Baptism identifies a person with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When someone enters the water of baptism, a few things are happening. First, there's a thing that's happening in an individual basic, basic, basis. The person is being baptized is committing themselves to the way of life that reflects the Jesus way. It is an individual commitment. It's a public sign that this person has repented of their sins, has received forgiveness of the sins, is choosing to die to sin and being raised to newness of life, a new way of living, empowered by the Holy Spirit and always pointing back to Jesus. So there's an individual action that's taking place. When someone says, I want to be baptized, it's because they are desiring to follow Jesus themselves. But then there's a second thing that happens in baptism. It's what the community does. They are saying, the community, that they accept this person into the family. So they are baptized. This person is baptized in the name of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, look in the verses. God himself lives in community. And we are then baptized into this community, a Jesus-centered community that represents the relational God. This community doesn't look like a power or kind of political structure of an empire, but it looks like a family. A family that loves, supports, and looks for ways to help brothers and sisters to flourish in this new way of living. So, we make disciples and we baptize people allowing people to make this choice, and then once they make the choice, we enfold them into this community. The third thing that Jesus, which is a good bones that Jesus is saying, this is what we need to do as a church, is this. Teach them everything Jesus commanded them. The third good bone is teach everything that Jesus taught. The main teachings of Jesus are found in the Sermon on the Mount, you can look at that in Matthew 5, 6, 7. And all of those 
commands, all of those teachings. Jesus says, even in the, uh, all the commands in the law of the prophets, they can all be summed up into this, these two commands. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've been around Coast Hills for a while, you will be able to hear the bass note of this command that resonates with all of our teaching because we believe this is what Jesus is teaching at his core. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. So teach them everything that Jesus has commanded. We're going to continue to be a Jesus-centered community. Teaching everything that Jesus has commanded. The hardest teaching of Jesus is to love your neighbor as yourself. But I would add that it's the most beautiful teaching of Jesus that pushes the boundaries to care not only for ourselves, but to those that are in our community both far and near. As we saw in our passage, it says, go make disciples of all nations. Break down barriers of all ethnicities. And later on, Paul says that there's no Jew, nor Greek, no male, no female. There is something that happens within the Jesus-centered community that says we need to love each other as ourselves. And that breaks down walls. And that is a beautiful thing to be able to allow and to push people, um, push people, yeah, push people to love like Jesus so that people would be um, in a place of flourishing of life, that they're cared for, that they're prayed for, um, and, and that we would continue to do that to those around us. Then the last words in verse 20. So we have those, we have those good bones. So at the beginning, we have this... Um, there were the worshiper, worship, people that are worshiping and people are doubting. Then we have these three good bones that, that Jesus says. Um, I, I laugh when I'm saying good bones, but uh, make disciples, baptize them, teach them everything Jesus commanded. Then at the end of that, in verse 20, Jesus leaves us with this promise that he will be with us until the very end of the age. In the midst of our fears, in the midst of our joys, in the midst of our missteps, in the midst of our laughter, Jesus will be with his church. In the midst of our renovation, Jesus will be with his church. So what will the renovations look like at Coast Hills Community Church in the future? Well, stay tuned to find out more in the weeks and the months to come. What we know for sure is this. We will be committed to making disciples. We'll be committed to baptizing people and their commitment to following Jesus in the context of community. And we will teach everything that Jesus taught. And when we do this, knowing that he has all power and authority and that he is with us to the very end, end of the age. This is what we are to do. This is how, uh, this is what we are to do, but the how actually is up to us. And we look forward to trying new things, experimenting with what does it look like to build around these good bones that Jesus has given us. I want to end with this quote by N.T. Wright. When he's speaking about this passage in Matthew 28, he says this. The claim that he, Jesus, the claim that Jesus is working to take it from here where it was under the rule not only of death but of corruption, greed, and every kind of wickedness and bring it by slow means and quick under the rule of his life-giving love. And how is he doing this? Here's the shock. 
through us, his followers. The project only goes forward insofar as Jesus' agents, the people he has commissioned, are taking it forward. End quote. So would you join us as we renovate, not the what, but the how we're going to be doing church? Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for sending your disciples over 2,000 years ago in the midst of their joy, in the midst of some people's doubts as well. Thank you for commissioning people to go and make disciples, helping people learn and unlearn a way of life. Thank you for allowing people the choice to step into this in the waters of baptism. God, would we have opportunities for people to do that in the months to come? God, thank you for the way that you have pointed us clearly to the person of Jesus and that we are to teach everything that Jesus taught. Would you help us wrestle with that? And as we wrestle with what it means to love our neighbor as ourself, would you help us break down some of those barriers in our own lives, in our own, with our neighbors, with ethnicities around us, with maybe social status, and our judgments we have with one another, allow us to be truly a Jesus-centered community that is creating gracious space through acts of generous love. And Jesus, thank you for the fact that you have reminded us that you are with us to the very end of age. Give us the wisdom to be able to put uh, different paint on, to be able to move this wall, to be able to take this out and add that, that we continue to do the, the what. Give us creativity to do the how, for the how. We look forward to what you have in store in our own personal lives, but also in the life of Coast Hills Community Church. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hello, Coast Hills, and uh, maybe friends that are watching as well. Um, once a month, we, it has been our practice that we gather together, and we have communion, uh, celebrating um, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The bread representing his body, and the cup, which we use just a plain cup this week. The cup, the wine, the juice representing his blood. We've had to do this as a COVID communion, meaning still giving people opportunity. So I wanna encourage you to go to your kitchen, grab what you have. Maybe some of you already have some bread or, or juice, or maybe some might wanna just grab um, maybe some crackers or whatever um, juice you might have and join us in this. I also wanna make mention that um, once a month, we also take an offering for our community care fund. And um, the way you're able to do that is you could go to our Tithely app. Um, I believe there's uh, in the show notes below, um, Tithely app and um, give a portion uh, of your giving to our community care fund that helps people in need. And um, that would be wonderful that we con would continue that. Uh, thank you for your giving. It's, it's been um, incredible. Uh, and then we've been able to help out uh, quite a number of people during this time. So, the gospel is the good news that God our Father, the Creator, out of His great love for us, has come to rescue us from sin and death and to renew all things through, through the work of Jesus 
on our behalf. We acknowledge God as our creator and give him thanks. We acknowledge our sinfulness in thought, word, and deed, the things we have done and the things we have left undone, and we know that we cannot save ourselves. So we trust Christ to be our Savior and our Redeemer, the one who lived for us, died for the sins of the world, and rose again. And we humble ourselves to seek to live lives of love and compassion, joining God in His work of renewal here on earth. So we come to the Lord's Supper together as God's family, as children of God. You see, Jesus makes the guestless, not us. His family, the church, chosen by God, followers of Jesus, is gathered from west to east to north and south and includes every color of humanity. Jesus, when he was resurrected from the dead, revealed himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread around a table. May our eyes be opened in a new way at this table. On the night that Jesus was handed over, he gathered his friends for a meal and he took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it saying, this is my body which is broken for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. Please, take whatever you have to represent Jesus' bread and eat. And after sharing the bread, Jesus took a cup of wine and he gave it to them to drink, saying, this is the blood, my blood, of the new covenant, which is poured out for many. Take and drink. Would you pray for me? Would you pray with me? Pray for me too. Jesus, thank you for this, for these symbols that represent who you are and what you've done for us. Jesus, thank you for giving your lives your life for us. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. Thank you for the love that is revealed so fully on the cross. God, would that love go deep into our bones? And may we continue to be a humble people, recipients of this love that you've given us. And would you empower us to live and love the same way towards others that we have received from you. Thank you for this table, this table of grace. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.
friends, receive this benediction. Go now into the world, inspired by the radiant love of God. Live generously, with open hands, loving one another as if your lives depended on it. Be good stewards of the gifts you have received, so that God may be glorified in all that you do and say. And may the abundant love of God surround you. May the extravagant grace of Jesus Christ sustain you. And may the constant presence of the Holy Spirit inspire you and encourage you in every good deed and word as you renovate. Live this life in this week in that kind of love, the kind of love that is present and particular. Amen. Amen.